Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us uh, for the GSH Group's webcast through Flyer. Um, today, the GSH Group focuses on, today's webcast will be on how the GSH Group focuses on the acquisition, management, and ownership of multifamily residential apartment communities in the United States. <clears throat> multifamily continues to prove itself to be the most resilient sector of the U.S. real estate market, and investors are winning with GSH. With, our concierge, with their concierge approach, they offer industry-leading communications and personalized investor relations services. They do the hard work, <clears throat> excuse me, they do the hard work and save investors, partners, the headaches and the time involved in owning an investment property. GSH prides itself on offering ethical and transparent opportunities for investors to achieve superior returns and immediate and ongoing income through quarterly distributions, capital growth, while maintaining a strong focus on capital preservation. I'm gonna hand it over to Gideon now. Um, thank you, and uh, we look forward to this great webcast. Thanks, Jeremy, and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I really appreciate uh, everyone's time and interest in, in this webcast and this webinar. Three ways GSH achieves alpha through multifamily real estate investing. Um, I want to keep this kind of fast paced and light. Uh, I, have a, I have a tendency at times to ramble and I'm going to do my best to not do that, but I wanted to kind of set expectations for the, uh, for the webcast for this webinar. I'm going to try and not talk for more than 30 minutes in total without asking some questions. Um, I'm going to lay out a little bit about the GSH group, who we are, because I think that's really important. So you have context in terms of our, my and our expertise in terms of uh, uh, what we do and how we do it. I'm going to show you a case study uh, about how we achieve alpha in our business plan. And then I'm going to share uh, information about an actual live deal that we have right now closing in about 30 days that we, we do have um, availability in if, if anybody's interested in learning more about how to invest with GSH. So I'm going to jump right in um, about the GSH group. So the GSH group uh, was created in 2017. Uh, I'm the G in the GSH group, as in Gideon. Uh, I'm also the CEO and managing partner of the GSH group. And we are a uh, multifamily uh, residential owner operator. We're headquartered in Michigan. Um, I actually am sitting in, on Singer Island in uh, Palm Beach County, Florida today. I split my time between South Florida and Michigan. And, our markets are primarily east of the Mississippi uh, and, and uh, kind of between Michigan and Florida. Right now we're in Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Maryland, and Florida in terms of our current portfolio with transactional experience in about 38 states. Our current portfolio sits just shy of about 6,000 units and uh, about a billion dollars in value. Um, and uh, this slide's a little bit dated, as you can tell by the, uh, by the uh, val portfolio value, uh, but we had a pretty uh, sizable year where uh, by the end of December, we'll have uh, purchased about 10 properties, about 3,000 units in those 10 properties, and we'll have raised and deployed approximately $130 million of investor equity uh, to buy about a half a billion dollars worth of, of multifamily apartment communities in four different states. And that was just in 2021 alone. Uh, we have uh, great cash and cash yields to our investors. And I, I, I wanted to mention, you know, what our current investor profile is. Typically, it's a high net worth investor or uh, a family, a uh, small private equity group that's interested in um, income. So most of our deals, because we're not institutional in nature, we don't have a three to five year in and out strategy. We purchase all of our properties uh, under the lens of will this be a good uh, investment long term? And uh, we have we usually perform it out for a hold somewhere between five and ten years, uh, but we're not required to sell at any given time. We're all about cash flow. We're all about achieving an ongoing alpha return. And to me, an ongoing alpha return is a double a low double digit return on an average basis throughout the life cycle of any property. And that's what uh, we're achieving. That's what we're achieving for our investors. Our investors are extremely happy with our performance. We're great at communication. We communicate with our investors on every single property. We update them monthly. We do quarterly uh, reports in more detail on top of the monthly uh, updates. And we do distributions quarterly. Uh, we've never missed a distribution. And we also um, 
are on target or better with all of our performance up until this point. Mentioned a little bit about the amount of uh, equity that we have uh, raised and deployed this year. As you can see, um, over the course of the last um, nine years, uh, we've, we've raised and deployed uh, just about $170 million. Uh, at the end of uh, this year, we'll update this chart to show um, probably about uh, just just above $250 million uh, over the course of the last handful of years. And obviously, since 2017, when GSH Group was formalized, prior to 2017, this is uh, kind of legacy uh, properties and, and, and ventures that myself and my two partners were a part of. Um, we've had incredible growth, and we've had incredible success, uh, really leveraging the, the lessons learned in the past in other residential endeavors allowing us to perform at a very high level with a all-star team uh, to, 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 pro to provide our investors uh, an amazing return. As I mentioned earlier, um, we've got a significant transactional experience. Uh, now, some of these stats not only include myself and my two partners, but also include our executive team. Um, but from a, from a transactional level, whether it be owning, buying, selling, renovating, consulting on, doing brokerage on, uh, we, we've got transactional experience in 38 different states. Um, we've got over hundred years of experience. Uh, we've done over 241 properties. We currently have 800, more than 800 happy investors, happy and satisfied. We were very involved and active in uh, the single family rental space uh, in, the, in the early 2010s, uh, specifically between 2010 and 2016. We've done over 2,500 houses, that's buy, renovate, and sell. And we've had an opportunity to be involved in the transactions of over 46,000 multifamily apartment units across the country and, and just shy of 16 million commercial square feet um, of commercial real estate. So I throw the stats up there because it's important that you understand the, the depth and the level of our partnership and our team. You know, we, we know what we're doing and we do a great job for our investors. Some advantages uh, that GSH has is, uh, you know, because of our, our, our not only history and transactional experience and history as GSH as, as, a, as, a, as a group as it is, but also uh, previous experiences, we've got great relationships with uh, banks, special servicers, um, someone on my executive team, uh, worked for special servicers for over a decade, finding valuations throughout the country, and and has you know those folks in in, in his contacts and his rolodex. Um, they know to, who to call when they've got a special situation for inventory. We've got great access to um, uh, you know top tier individuals at at banks. Uh, one, one of my partners, Anand List, was on the board of uh, the Third Bank in in the Michigan region. Uh, and that just those connections allow us to see greater opportunities. Um, we also have great relationships with owners. You know, when you transact and 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 you do what you say you're going to do, you get a good reputation. And and throughout the years, GSH has done just that. So we get phone calls um, often, quite a bit today. Even though the market is very competitive and a lot, and most properties go to market. Um, there are also a lot of owners who are seeing where the pricing is and, and, and would be interested in selling, but don't want to put their, uh, their properties into a competitive uh, situation with, you know, a ton of different buyers, with a ton of different people seeing their financials and walking on the properties and things like that. So because of our experience and um, transactional fortitude and, and follow through, we, we get the ability to, to see properties that either don't Others don't, frankly. I would say that out of the 10 properties that we'll transact on this year, um, six of them were quote unquote off market, which, which is a benefit you know, to our investors uh, and, and to ourselves. In addition, we, 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 we invest in and we take a, you know, a, a huge level of importance we put on technology. Um, you know, efficiency. We've got we've got folks in different locations all the time. We've got properties in different states and different markets, and and we leverage technology to be working in real time uh, as a team, even if uh, distance, uh, even if there's distance between us. And obviously, with COVID and and work from home and 
um, kind of the new normal as it relates to the work environment for folks, you know, technologies have played uh, an even larger role uh, in terms of communication and, and real-time data. And I'm pleased to say that we were already at the forefront of, of that type of workplace prior to 2020. And, and we didn't miss a beat in 2020 when, when things started to slow down for others. We also vertically integrated ourselves in our business plans uh, on a day-to-day -day basis by having an affiliate construction company that, that does all of our uh, budgeted CapEx work. Um, and, and, and that allows us to make sure that we're uh, coming in on time and on budget and, and, and fulfilling the business plan because time is money, especially in this, in this industry. So uh, I mentioned uh, our investor profile uh, earlier and, and, and smart investors work with us. Uh, they, they, they love the income that we provide and the, and the high cash and cash returns that we distribute on a quarterly basis. They love that predictable income. The investment is secured in real property. Um, and we do make a social impact with our Meadows brand, uh, which I'll talk about in a bit. So I'm gonna go into our, 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 our favorite business model as it relates to multifamily residential apartments. Um, you know, apartment communities are, are nothing new. And throughout uh, the United States, you'll see uh, older properties and newer properties, depending on where you are. Uh, we, call, we, we, we like to focus on uh, old and new, but you know, our darling in our portfolio is what we call vintage workforce housing. Vintage is just a fancy word for old. So what that means, old to me means uh, maybe a property built in the 60s or 70s or 80s. And, and while that age sometimes scares other buyers away or, or, or other investors, we love it. We love it for a variety of reasons, but, um, and I'll go into those, uh, I'll go into those right now. So uh, essentially, with older properties, what I what we found is that because of the cost of land prices today, properties that were built in the '60s and the '70s were built on a much larger uh, amount of land, larger acreage, right? And, and 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 let me be more specific about the type of properties that we buy. We you know we buy what are called garden style walk up properties. So typically, a garden style property. Um, or community is a bunch of different two or three story buildings that um, have stairs and not elevators that you walk up to. Typic our typical property has uh, um, two to 300 units. Uh, well, and we do own plenty of properties with more than 300 and, and, and some with less than 200, but that's kind of our average in terms of acquisition. And um, these older properties are built on more land and often the square footages of the units are actually bigger. So while the properties might be older and, and, and there might be some uh, deferred maintenance or, or work to be done at the properties, we find that if we get in there and are thorough in terms of our uh, construction budgets and, and, don't, and we don't leave any stone unturned and make sure we're prepared uh, for what uh, the property uh, might entail as it relates to uh, a maintenance when we buy the property, um, we're able to compete uh, against newer properties uh, in a variety of ways. The first one is basically, I'm gonna go back a couple. The first one is, uh, as I mentioned, you know, a larger square footage uh, in, the, in the unit. So in, in today's economy with people staying home more and working from home, it's really important that folks uh, have a large amount of space, and not just space on the inside, but then also on the outside. And I mentioned that you know these older properties are often built on a larger uh, acreage. Like we're we're under contract right now on a property uh, in Michigan that has uh, 41 buildings across 40 acres. You know that's that that's excuse me 40 buildings across 41 acres. So that's actually more than one acre per building. And what that allows for is a lot more green space and a lot more areas to amenitize. Amenitized meaning pools, playgrounds, dog parks, community gathering areas, uh, a real community campus feel, and so that type of that type of land on the outside and square footage on the inside of the units is not always available for newer product. As newer product is uh, land is more expensive, and the cost of construction is expensive, and so we're really trying to developers are trying to 
really maximize the amount of buildable square feet on the, the land footprint and put as many units, create you know uh, a, a, a higher than normal density uh, in the in the unit. So we, we find that if we can buy an older property and we can elevate it from an exterior and interior perspective on the, on the units, as well as the, uh, the amenities on the outside where people uh, want to live and play, we can actually compete with newer products because we'll be able to provide all of these great uh, amenities and, and a great living space to our uh, residents at a more competitive price than a newer product or new, new, new piece. And um, we also like vintage properties because Again, I mentioned, you know, we'll be able to compete with newer product at a more affordable price. You know, we're not trying to compete toe to toe from a price point perspective for new construction. You know, new construction, it's, it, 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 some people would, you know, call it A-class properties, you know, uh, stuff that's built brand new, um, demands because of today's economics and building costs and, and land costs, uh, a very high rental rate. You know, workforce housing, as I mentioned, earlier is um, really for our country's essential workers, right? 80% um, of the population uh, are, are, are earning, you know, you know the, the average median income for an area, right? And the average median income for an area, especially in places like the Midwest uh, and, and um, uh, well, really, really anywhere, uh, the typical person might not be able to afford the rents that are needed uh, to be charged at a new construction project. You know, I'll use Michigan for an example, um, and these these numbers might be low compared to you know those folks. You know, those of you who are in New York or on the West Coast or the Southeast. But you know, in Michigan, for example, um, uh, you probably have to charge somewhere between two thousand and twenty five hundred dollars for a two bedroom unit that's built new, right? Um, and the average income, you know, for the for the average essential worker, even a household of two earners, uh, in Michigan is probably somewhere between sixty five thousand and one hundred thousand. So, the thought of paying two thousand dollars or twenty five hundred dollars a month is is really high. So we can come in and we can have a, a competitive uh, apartment community where maybe we only have to charge twelve hundred or fifteen hundred dollars and provide a huge value to our, not only to our investors, but also to our residents. Um, so they can have a great living space that's been elevated and renovated and, and beautiful. Uh, they can have an exterior area that's superior really to new construction because there's no more land, more places to walk, more places to walk their dog uh, and, and amenities that, that compete with new construction at a more affordable price. And this type of product is finite. I think that's something that's, that, that, that people, don't realize like it's virtually impossible to build class B affordably priced housing. I'm not talking about affordable housing. We, we don't play in the space where um, there's government subsidies on the property, but affordably play, priced living is, be, is becoming more and more in demand um, as the wealth, wealth gap increases in our country. Um, so, you know, this class B workforce housing is something that we've been focused on from inception, but it's becoming more and more interesting uh, even to larger institutional type groups because of uh, the high demand to our country's essential workers and the high returns that, that are garnered. I'm gonna show you a case study. This is a property that we purchased in Indianapolis, Indiana. We purchased it in the first quarter of 2021. It was, it's called Viridian Castleton. Uh, Viridian Castleton it was um, 398 units. Uh, as you can see from the picture here, it was it was all kind of this. These, these are some townhouse units. I think there was probably about 30 of these townhouses, and the rest were kind of that garden style walk up uh, basis. But th this property was located on this huge campus. It's overwhelming amount of, of green space. And what we found when we moved when we bought the property was that, or, or leading up to purchasing the property, was that the current owner did a great job renovating it. They, they bought it four years ago, five years ago now, I suppose. Um, and, they, and they created real value for themselves and their investors, but they really didn't do much to the amenities. Um, amenities being playgrounds and pools and fitness facilities, um, 
uh, dog parks, things like that. There wasn't a dog park on site. The uh, playground that was on site, there was only one, and it was uh, very old, probably a 30 year old playground. Um, and the pool area was kind of lackluster. Uh, the fitness facility was the same. And what we realized was that we could go in and we could elevate the property in a few different ways. They, they, the average square footage of the units at Viridian Castleton were a thousand square feet. And that's, that's a decent size. So um, we went in and we, we started tying the property together from a leasing office perspective, uh, we elevated the fitness facility. Um, we did other kind of deferred maintenance, uh, normal capital uh, solutions like uh, redoing all the roofs and a uh, portion of the windows, redoing all the common area hallways. Um, but we also uh, have plan and have started to implement other amenities like uh, elevating the pool, creating a great gathering space, barbecue areas, cabanas, um, uh, replacing that, that old dated uh, and potentially dangerous playground with, with newer um, uh, facilities and also adding two other small satellite playgrounds with, with picnic tables and gathering areas for families, as well as adding um, three dog parks throughout the, the property. Um, things that people really care about, things that people look at and want to live and, and would want in their areas of living. And what we were able to do is basically what I, what I described before. We were able to basically take this property located in a wonderful location in Indianapolis um, with, with great schools. Uh, you know, it sits right in an area with, with very uh, high priced homes, um, really a desirable area to live. But what we were able to do was have it from a community perspective and, a, and a, an amenity perspective compete with new construction in Indianapolis. And where the new construction might have been charged charging somewhere between $2,000 and $2,400 in rent, we elevated the rents only by a couple hundred dollars and still found ourselves three to four hundred dollars below what the new construction is with a competing asset that I think that in a lot of ways was superior based, you know, in terms of size. Um, we were able to, through this business plan, increase the occupancy up to a hundred percent. We're actually achieving um, uh, rents there on, on new leases for the past handful of months that are indicative of our second year of ownership in our performa, where um, we, we've owned it for less than a year. And it's really been um, a great success for us and, and one indicative of, of this business model of, of workforce um, older properties. Um, GSH, it's not the, again, it's not the only type of property that we buy, but we found that this type of asset in, in, in these type of um, locations, the Midwest specifically, uh, outperform Proforma time and time again. They allow us to get to double digit cash on cash returns and also uh, IRRs on exit to our investors that are very similar to the markets that a lot of people think of like the coast or the Southeast. Um, we're achieving it in the Midwest. And, um, Again, like I said, we're in the Midwest, we're in the Mid-Atlantic in, in, in Maryland, we're in Florida, and we're doing fine in those locations as well. But I wanted to take some time today to talk about what we're doing and our focus uh, kind of in more of the center of the United States, uh, because as cap rates continue to compress, we're still finding great opportunities for substantial income. Um, and so, you know, what do we do? We acquire well-located vintage properties with sustainable rent growth and smartly elevate them to compete but maintain affordability with, with, with new products. Um, we increase revenue through other income and, and intelligently reduce expenses. That's that's management, you know, that's what what how is the previous owner managing this property? And is there a benefit? Are there things that we can do better um, from a revenue and expense perspective? Um, and then, you know, as we increase, as we execute on those two, those first two points, um, we're increasing our net operating income, which obviously uh, with commercial real estate increases uh, the value of the properties through capital growth and appreciation. I'm going to now talk about um, a, a new opportunity that we have. Uh, it's actually, it's a live deal. It's one that we're under contract on uh, in Michigan. Uh, again, that's our backyard. That's where uh, GSH is headquartered. 
Um, and uh, this is a this is an opportunity that uh, you know if if you're intrigued by what I'm talking about, um, if you if you're aware of of what I'm talking about, but maybe haven't pulled the plug, or if you're looking to work with a new great sponsor, um, I'd welcome you know communication after this uh, after this webinar uh, to to share more about this opportunity with you, and and, um, and and welcome you know anybody to join join us in this uh, in this opportunity. Um, the Meadows at Canton, it's currently called the Crossings at Canton, it is a 736 unit uh, apartment community in Canton, Michigan. Uh, Canton, Michigan is uh, a, a suburb um, of Ann Arbor. Uh, it's it's uh, located to the west of Detroit, um, not in Detroit, uh, but, but the west uh, of it and, and about a 20 minute ride from uh, Ann Arbor, which is where the University of Michigan uh, is. It's a highly desirable, desirable uh, township, uh, great schools, great employment opportunities, um, great communities as it relates to all the single family. Um, this is an area that's continued to grow and thrive and be built up over the course of the last 10, 20 years. Um, it's an area where a lot of the national, you know, regional and national home builders have built subdivisions and communities. Um, and this property is a property that was built in the late 60s uh, that um, sits right in the middle of it all. Literally, like on this on uh, on this little picture where the the property is highlighted in yellow. If you look at uh, the 275, the highway, um, just to the left, just to the west, there's a new Amazon fulfillment center being built, you know, just literally within less than a mile to the west of the property across 275. Um, there's a new Henry Ford Health Center uh, that's part of one of the largest health systems in this region um, being built right across the street from the Amazon. Um, there continues to be investment and development along this whole corridor from here to Ann Arbor and then back east to, uh, to the city of Detroit. Um, and, and we're really excited about the opportunity to purchase this property. Story with this property is that, again, this, this, this property is built on 52 acres. Like I was mentioning, a ton of green space, a ton of areas to amenitize. The current owner is selling um, for a few different reasons. And, and, and it's really important for me to discuss it because I think that therein lies the opportunity. So the current owner purchased this property in 2017. And has done a phenomenal job with it really focusing on the interiors of the units and, and, and renovating it really to an A-class job. As you can see uh, uh, in these pictures, um, knocking down walls and creating open floor plans between the kitchens and the living rooms, uh, installing completely new finishes, new countertops, stainless steel appliances, quartz countertops throughout the entire uh, project, all, all the units. Um, and then, um, Kind of, you know, in 2020, COVID slowed him down a little bit. Um, but when he purchased the property and throughout ownership, he treated this property kind of like a, a redevelopment as it related to the unit renovations, where he would he would basically vacate and pull offline 30 to 40 units at a time, and renovate them, and then put them back online to lease, and then right around the same time, you know, prepare and pull the next 30 to 40 units offline. So at any given point, there would be 30 to 80 units offline. And what that did was that artificially uh, reduced the occupancy numbers there uh, in the historical financials. And then in order for him to uh, fill them back up and lease them quicker, he would give out uh, rental concessions to, to lease them up quickly. And a rental concession is like a free month's rent. Sign, sign a lease today and you get a free month's rent, right? And that's a line item in, in the financials that works against your overall revenue, right? And what we noticed was that um, vacancy was high and concessions were high. Our complete business plan at this property is there's 190 units that still need to be renovated. There's a delta between a classic unit and a renovated unit of between $85 and $300, depending on the unit type or the unit size. So we're going to go in, we're going to renovate the remaining 190 units, not all at once, but on turn once the, the current resident moves out. And we're just going to stabilize. What we did was we, we, we recognized that as we were analyzing the financials over a 12-month period, and then income over a six-month period, income over a three-month period annualized, and over a 
a, a one month period annualized, we saw that occupancy was going up, concessions were going down, and they were normalizing. All we really needed to do is come in here and continue to stabilize this, this, uh, this project from an occupancy and a, um, and, a, and a concession perspective. Detroit is, or Metro Detroit, excuse me, Southeastern Michigan, this is not a Detroit property. Metro, uh, Canton, Michigan and, and Southeastern Michigan, it's not a concession type of market. Like you do, we don't offer concessions on any of our other properties in Michigan. We own 30, over 3,000 units here. Um, so he was just doing it artificially to fill the units up because of the way that his redevelopment of the property was, was going. So our performa is very simple. While there is, we feel probably another 100 to $200 in organic rent that we could achieve. That's not in our performa, that's not in our numbers. We stayed very conservative. Our only plan here is to finish the 190 units, elevate the exterior on a much, on a grand scale um, to make the exterior curb appeal feel commensurate with the beautiful interior units that you can see here. And, um, and, and manage it well, you know, and, and manage it, you know, maybe a little bit more efficiently than today, but, but, you know, he's doing a great job. We're just taking over the seller's selling. I'll go back to the, the statement of why is the seller selling? So the seller bought the property four years ago and his, the equity that he brought to the table was uh, institutional in nature. Um, there was a time limit to the amount of time that the, the equity would have been out. And I think that because of 2020, he got slowed down because of the pandemic. Uh, and wasn't able to finish the project, probably took, you know, again, like took it to about 80%. Um, but his current uh, equity wants to cash in the chips. They're going to do very well in terms of the cost basis that they purchased the property for and what they're going to be selling it to us for. Um, there are also some concerns over where capital gains might go uh, next year or beyond. So they felt like a sale in the calendar year of 2021 was prudent for them. Uh, and that way they're able to leave some meat on the bone for the next buyer. So we're incredibly excited about this opportunity. A little overview of the of the property uh, deal is uh, uh, it's a uh, the per total purchase price is one hundred twenty five million seven hundred fifteen thousand dollars. That works out to just shy of one hundred seventy one thousand a door. Our total capitalization is just shy of one hundred forty four million. We're getting into um, uh, variable rate uh, construction bridge financing for the first twenty four to thirty six months which is basically financing for the acquisition and the construction. We're putting about $10 million of CapEx into the property, mostly on the infrastructure and the grounds. Um, and uh, our minimum investment uh, in the property is, uh, is uh, $50,000. Uh, we pay a preferred return that's a bit above market. We pay a 9% preferred return. Above the preferred return and after all capital is returned, there's a promote split with 65% going to investors and 35% going to GSH Group. We're raising just about $29 million for this property. We've got about $5 million less left in our raise um, that, that is still open. It'll fill up probably quickly over the next week or two. Um, but I encourage you, if this uh, project looks potentially interesting to you, to reach out and see if we can create a conversation and a relationship. I'm gonna kind of breeze through some of this and then take some questions. Um, our targeted investor IRR, this is not a deal-based IRR, but an investor IRR is just shy of 18%. That's over the course of a seven-year hold. Um, the targeted equity multiple for our investors, again, not deal-based, but to our investors is, is just over 2.5 X. And our average cash on cash return over a seven year period for the deal is over 12 and a half percent. That's an alpha return if I've ever seen one. This is the type of returns that we're generating for our investors on a you know a day to day basis and paying them quarterly. And our investor base keeps growing because we're performing. Um, I don't want to keep rambling about that deal. And it's been about been about 30 minutes, so I'm, I'm right on track with that. I'm going to um, exit the slides and uh, and and see if uh, maybe there's some questions, Jeremy. Yeah, I got one. Um, so, what of the states is offering the most attractive returns, or like where do you see the most opportunity from the different states in your coverage areas? It's a really great question. Um, I would say that uh, we're we're seeing the highest cash on cash return from an income perspective. 
Um, and, I, and like I mentioned, a lot of our investors are, are very, you know, they're, they're, they're high net worth folks who have a bunch of cash and they want to put their cash to work. And while a big pop from a purchase and a sale is beneficial to everybody, you know, once I sell a property uh, or refinance a property, my investors are saying, that's great, but what am I going to do with the money? Do you have a deal that I can invest in? So it's very cash, cash flow oriented, you know, for probably about 80% of my investors. Um, and that's kind of why we look long term in our deals. Uh, but to answer the question specifically, we see the highest cash and cash returns in the Midwest. Again, we're in um, Michigan, Ohio, and Indiana, and we're, we're able to achieve double digit returns typically by years three or four um, after you know stabilization and refinancing in those states. Now, having said that, we're seeing extreme rent growth in our Maryland market. We're seeing you know great rent growth in, in Florida. Um, but that from a cash on cash returns perspective, out of the gate, the numbers are, high, are higher in the Midwest and, uh, and, and over the, the life of the deal, we're seeing those still higher, you know, kind of what we got used to, you know, four or five, six years ago, we're still able to achieve at times in the Midwest. Okay. We got another question here. Um, in those, these vintage properties, what are you seeing per door cost per unit? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think it depends on if we're renovating the units or not. And um, uh, cause I, I roll all of it in, you know, interior unit renovations as well as exterior unit renovations. But for the most part, we're at, we're renovating on properties that we buy. This one's unique that we're not renovating all of the units. We're just renovating, you know, 20, 25% of them. Um, typically when we renovate a unit, uh, it's costing us depending on the location and the finishes anywhere from $9,000 to $13,000 a door. And, uh, and then we, on average, are seeing um, anywhere from $2 million to $5 million total for exterior renovations and common area renovations. That's usually uh, common area hallways, at times roofs, at times mechanical systems of, in varying degrees, at times uh, windows. Um, and so the Meadows and Canton, the Meadows at Canton being a larger property, you know, 736 units, um, which isn't our only uh, community with 700 plus units. Uh, to, I just wanted to throw that out there, but because it's so large, um, our, our total capital plan is about $10 million for the entire project. Okay, um, what does your process look like when you're evaluating those vintage units? How do you really, find the good deals? I really appreciate the, 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 these questions. These are great questions. They're helping me out too. Um, so look, to find good deals today, you have to cast a really wide net, you know, a really big net. And I've got an amazing acquisitions team made up of six people who are constantly speaking to brokers, calling owners, evaluating properties in locations near other properties that we own. Um, and, uh, you know, this year to buy 10 properties, we literally have underwritten more than 400 deals, you know. Um, and so in order to find good deals, you have to look for, you have to look at a lot of deals. You have to find that that needle on the haystack. Um, Jeremy, can you repeat the question for me just specifically? Because I feel like there was another question. Sure, part. sure. Um, so like, what's your process of evaluating the vintage deal? So once you do find it, like... What are some of the like? Um, so, so once we find a deal that looks interesting to us, we'll go visit the property. Um, we'll get we'll get we'll get a tour of the inside and the outside of it, um, and we'll usually visit the the property once or twice prior to putting in an offer. Um, and 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 we'll have our, I mentioned earlier when I was talking about uh, uh, my company in general, we've got a um, an affiliate construction company called Multifamily Commercial Construction or MFCC as we call it. Um, and we'll have a, a, a construction project manager or one of our partners at MFCC join us for those property tours so we can work together to evaluate a generalized capital plan. Once we get under contract with the property and we start doing due diligence, we're walking every single unit, we're getting inside every single unit. And we're also doing an inventory, item, an itemized inventory of all mechanical systems. And with these vintage older properties, we need to know what we're getting ourselves into from a systems perspective. So we're doing a, an audit on 
how many boilers, how many chillers, how many HVACs, how many magic packs, how many AC condensers. Um, when were they last replaced? Are they original? If they are, we got to replace them. If they've been replaced in the last 10 years, what's their condition? And we're budgeting in our cap capital plan to basically completely overhaul the property so it's as close to brand new as we can. Not only we do are we that specific, we're also general from a contingency perspective. So we're always really high on our construction contingencies um, and what we call miscellaneous. So the Meadows at Canton, I literally have a million dollars of miscellaneous in my in my capex plan. That's for unknowns. That's for plumbing issues that could occur. That's for things that maybe we missed. The beautiful thing though about that is that because we're on construction bridge, the money's available to us to pull down if we spend it, but we don't have to spend it. So if I only use four hundred thousand dollars of that extra contingency, then we'll just you know we'll be ahead. Our our pro forma is modeled out that we're using the full million, but you know we don't necessarily have to. Okay, I got more questions in. Um, this one's from a Frank. He actually has two questions. So I'll ask his first one, then I'll go to the second one, then I'll go to Sanjay's question. So Frank wants to know, um, another one just came in. Sorry, I didn't knock it down. How much are GSH partners contributing to the equity? So um, GSH partners, we, we always contribute um, personally, the three of us contribute anywhere between five and 10% of the equity. And then we also always uh, bring in, create a GSH investment entity where our contribution goes. And then we bring in some of our very, some of our family and close um, friends, you know, people whose money would be worse to lose than our own uh, to co-invest with us. So typically we're in that investment entity, we're, we're somewhere between 15 and 25% of the total equity. Okay. What exit cap rates are you assuming and computing the IRR for the deal? That's also from Frank. Uh, I don't want to misspeak, but I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, while we're talking, I'm going to um, just, just look at my, uh, my performance, but I, I believe it's um, a full percentage point higher than what we're entering at. Um, I, I believe that on, on these deals, it's 5%, but I'll, okay. I'll, I'll confirm. Okay. You want me the next question or need a yeah, I'll, yeah, yeah, please. All right. The next one's from Sanjay. Is there a capped management fee for GSH? Yeah, let me talk about fees because I think it's important. Um, we we GSH, uh, you know, we're we're not cheap. Uh, we're really good at what we do, and we know what we're worth. And we all of our fees really pay for our team. We've got an amazing rock star team that you know we get what we pay for. Uh, we we charge a two percent acquisition fee. We charge a two percent ongoing asset management fee that's tied to uh, EGI or effective gross income. Uh, and then on the management side, we don't self-manage. We use a third-party property manager. Uh, in this in this case, for the Meadows at Canton, it's uh, called BezTech Property Management. Uh, BezTech is located in Michigan. They're, they're a nationwide property management company, uh, mostly in the uh, eastern part of the country. They manage over 32,000 apartment units. Where we make up about 10% of their management portfolio. They manage all of our stuff in Ohio and Michigan. Um, and we they 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 we pay them three percent of the effective gross income as well victor wants to know after repositioning on a percentage basis are your unit expenses coming down and by what percentage on average if you had to guess you know it's a good question um my, the i'm assuming the unit expenses you mean like the unit like operating expenses um I don't have that information in front of me, like specifically, forgive me. And, and, and on the webinar right now, it's a little bit difficult for me to um, uh, maneuver through into, our, into my pro forma, but based on where the market is and, and what we're seeing in elevations of uh, item, you know, cost of materials, cost of labor, payroll, things like that. Also, you know, we're always assessing and using a third party tax consultant to, to really understand where taxes are going to adjust to when we purchase new properties, property taxes. Um, usually, our, usually our expenses per unit goes up, you know, and I, and I think that that's actually a good thing because it's a conservative underwriting. You know, in today's market, there are times when people are paying too much in payroll, not often, 
but sometimes there, there's sometimes they're paying too much in in repair and maintenance or contract services. There's been there's been situations where, you know, um, a, a company is, uh, you know, an owner has owned a property for 30 years and they're basically just subcontracting out uh, every single maintenance request and 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 they're paying retail basically for all of their construction and 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 maintenance related services and in those examples were able to uh, reduce those expenses. As relates to this property, as I mentioned earlier, the, the expense of concession is going down. So if you add, even though concession is kind of like a revenue line item, um, if you work into that, because but that's a huge detractor from the net income, if you, if you factor that into the bottom line with all expenses, our, our expenses are probably going down because that's the crux of this business model. Our property taxes are going up, but our occupancy is going to go up and stay there and our, and our, and our concessions are going to eventually go away. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Are you open to partnering in Texas given the depth of your investor base and experience for the right deal? Uh, short answer is yes, and just reach out to me. We do do uh, co-GP situations on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. Uh, next one, um, what are the new areas you're targeting? That kind of like comes right off the Texas one. Uh, if there are any, what are the new states or areas that you're targeting or that you're excited about? Um, so I'm going to jump into that question just in a second. I, I looked up on my phone um, I might perform on my phone, uh, the exit cap. And so our exit cap on the Meadows at Canton is a five and a quarter. We're purchasing the property just above a four. So it's it's all, literally almost a 1.25% increase in cap rate. Um, it's probably conservative. I mentioned that we've been conservative in our underwriting. Typically, up until this point where cap rates have become really compressed, you know, maybe 50 basis points a 50 basis point increase uh, from acquisition cap rate to sale cap rate was industry norm. Uh, this is 75 basis points higher than that. Um, okay, and then the, the question had to do with locations, like what, what other locations are- Yeah, what, what other this, locations- I'll, I'll, talk about, I'll talk about areas that we, you know, uh, markets that we uh, chase deals in and, and weren't successful in buying. Um, okay. You know, we-, we Georgia, uh, the, the Georgia and Atlanta metro is, is a very hot market. It, it, prices are really high, but we we did go after a couple of deals there. The Carolinas, I spent a lot of time in my single family days in North and South Carolina. We, we, we did uh, compete for some deals in North Carolina, both Charlotte and Raleigh, Durham uh, this year, but un unsuccessfully. Um, Texas, uh, we... Uh, 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 we're looking in Dallas and I've got a, a, somebody that works for us um, looking for opportunities and raising capital in Austin. Um, love the Austin market. I think that it's going to continue to grow. Loved it, love Texas in general. Um, and uh, I, think, I think those are others. But I mean, look, I think that for us, um, geography matters. Um, in terms of the ease of, of, of getting to the property. You know, I typically like to be able to get on a plane, a commercial plane and, or have my team get on a commercial plane and be able to be there within three hours. You know, it, it, it you can take a day trip or a night trip if necessary at times. Um, we visit the properties a lot. So burning it two days to travel to the West Coast isn't necessarily the most conducive for us, even those great opportunities out there. Um, and, and a place that we feel uh, fundamentally is going to be smart in, over the long term um, and that we can build a, a strong footprint. You know, I'll, I'll buy a property in Tennessee of 150 units or 200 units if I think that I can build a thousand units around it, you know, or I just pulled Tennessee out of the air, but, you know, any kind of real market where we can provide and build scale. I think that in 2022, you'll see GSH getting into a couple new markets, not necessarily new to us as individuals, uh, as I mentioned earlier, with all of our scale and, 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 and experience, but maybe as it relates to the GSH portfolio in general. Okay. Um, let me see. Uh, are there any opportunities with your construction development company? Uh, like from an employment perspective? Um, sure. Send us a message. Okay. All right. Let's see. Are there any more questions? 
Okay. Do you have any closing thoughts that you want to share with everyone? Um, yeah, sure. I, well, first of all, it's, you know, it's been 50 minutes. I, you know, I, I understand that everybody's time is really valuable and I appreciate you taking this time and investing in your, your time with me. Um, really at the end of the day, uh, people invest with us because they trust us. Uh, they like our integrity or our ethics. You know, we look at, G at GSH, we look at ourselves serving two different clients on a day-to-day -day basis. And that translates itself from everything we do from our team, from myself, my partners, down to our team. We, on one hand, we've got our, our investor partners who, you know, expect, uh, and, and we, we strive to give a transparent and ethical way to achieve a superior return or an alpha. On the other hand, we've got our residents you know, and we strive every day to give them a, a safe, clean, and affordably priced place to live. And if we're achieving, you know, those two goals on a regular basis, then we're doing a great job. And up until this point, we are. Um, I can. I'm, I'm happy to give investor references. I'm happy to give service provider references. The the deal, the Meadows on Canton, is one that I'm extremely excited to buy. Um, the, the raise has been moving really quickly, a $29 million raise. As I mentioned this year, we'll raise over $130 million. Actually, I don't even know if I mentioned that, but this year we'll raise over $130 million of investor equity and deploy it. Um, that speaks to our, uh, our following. You know, our, we're making money for people, we're consistent, we're great with communicators. Um, and if you're interested in getting involved in, in the passive real estate game, uh, the take advantage of great cash on cash returns and all the tax benefits that come along with uh, real estate investing. You know, we do uh, cost segregation and we and, and, and um, benefit from accelerated depreciation. I think this is a great opportunity with this live deal to start a conversation with GSH and with me and, and hopefully, you know, maybe jump in on this first deal together. With that, I appreciate everybody's time. Hopefully you learned a little bit about strategy. If, if, if we don't, you know, there's no hard sell with me either. If you want to reach out, we can start a conversation. We'll be doing this for a long time. So I'm never going to try and make somebody invest who doesn't want to invest, but this is an opportunity. I thought it'd be a, a good opportunity for me to put it out there on this webinar. So thanks for listening and I uh, appreciate the time.